All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our um, fourth talk in the series, How Do We Go Forward? How Do We Go Back? Tonight, we're looking at blended careers, and I am so, so thrilled to welcome Alexandra Stelianos and Melissa Yes. Um, Alexandra Stelianos is a dance maker, educator, and intermediate artist currently living in Chicago. And Melissa Yes is an artist, educator, and co-director of Vinegar, which is a contemporary art nonprofit based out of Birmingham, Alabama. How are you both doing? You first, Lexi. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say our, um, our tense breath, I feel like, was just a um, good indication of that. Um, I feel like my whole answer for the past few months has been fine, generally, generally fine, you know? figuring out the new normal and um, I think the biggest thing like my biggest summary is figuring out like what um, in my life and practice um, can be moved into this like new forced online environment and what just needs to be placed on hold and like that has been like a learning curve um, the between like what I feel like I have to do and want to do and, and what works and um, also, like, I, I've seen a few artists uh, talking about and, and educators saying, like, you know, don't feel pressured to make right now, and then just balancing that whole thing with all, all of your personal life stuff. I don't know. Uh, 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 that's the sound. I'm going uh, yeah. to offer, like, a sound and a gesture. Uh, that feels accurate. Uh, I feel that within myself, yeah. How about you? How are you feeling? How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty well right now. Uh, I feel like for me, COVID has been, I've experienced it in chapters. Mm -hmm. Chapter one was like dread and uh, anxiety and depression and, you know, just not knowing how, what it was going to look like um, for the globe, for, you know, people's lives, but also for higher education and my career and my loved ones, my neighbors. Um, and I also had a unfortunate, uh, incident with my cat when all of that was happening it was just like it was a really rough time and then following that period it was a period of um of reflection and that's where I mean not that I hadn't been reflecting on the situation in a sort of critical way before then but this is when I started to hone in on um how I can best be of service right now I like I really recognize my privilege and that I was still employed Right? Like I'm, I'm still employed at the university. I have a full-time job and um, in that job, I also have a platform where I can speak to the community uh, a little bit through like re represent the department in the community. Um, thinking about, you know, how can we best use that platform to support uh, what needs to be supported. And also as a co-director of this new art nonprofit, Vinegar, which had a grand opening weeks before COVID came to the United States. Um, you know, how do, how do I responsibly and respectfully manage that with everything that's going on first with the pandemic and then with um, the tensions over uh, racial violence in this country? Um, so a lot of serious critical thinking and reflection is carrying through into this new chapter that I, I feel is full of a little bit more optimism and part of that's, I think, just because I'm kind of used to it now, <laughs> like, um, for, like in terms of my own experience. And um, I think we're all starting to get used to it. And so now these conversations about um, how we can move forward are starting to happen and it feels really positive. And uh, things are starting to percolate in terms of programs maybe we can do to help with conversations around race. Um, the lingering, uh, storm cloud over my head right now is what the fall is going to look like in the university. Absolutely. I, yeah. um, I think, uh, so like my current, like, uh, teaching and, and connection to academia is I'm adjuncting it to community colleges in the Chicago area. And, um, when the shit hit the fan, it, I kind of was like, well, adjunct life is already so precarious and, chaotic as is semester to semester like this feels par for the course in like a kind of <laughs> how do I use humor to get myself online kind of way um and then in that position like I um I have been like craving even more so um the 
camaraderie of having a full-time position um, because I feel very disconnected from my schools, even staying together, um, like staying connected with the departments, like not knowing what's going on in the fall. Like I, uh, I have so much uncertainty, even more so than normal. Um, even just like, how are we able, how are we going to be able to communicate well enough to, to get back into our spaces safely? Um, students, but also faculty members, because um, both the programs I work at, there are no full-time faculty, we're all adjuncts. Um, I was recently um, put in the position of dance program coordinator for one, so I'm really like thinking about all the different ways that these um, these teachers are just moving throughout the community and we're in downtown Chicago and it's an urban commuter campus. There's so many bodies moving, which is what got me excited about the position in the first place, but it's keeping my anxiety for fall higher. Mm -hmm. um, and I am uh, anticipating that there's probably going to be a lack of classes due to drop in student enrollment and I do not blame them. Mm -hmm. I would not feel safe in that same environment. Um, so yeah, there's, there's um, a lot happening. I did, um, I have lost um, a lot of work because of this, because I am um, adjuncting and uh, teaching and uh, uh, making work with a company that was supposed to kind of premiere in June, a little project-based company. And it, it's gonna happen, we're gonna get there, we're gonna launch somehow, Springboard or Seesaw or how, I don't even know, um, but, uh, you know, um, we were we were preparing for a commission and a festival, and then a full um, full length show next summer, and then figuring out how to like keep that together, but not forcibly in this Zoom space is has been interesting. It's been it's been grounding though. That has been a um, the art making part has been an anchor um, mm -hmm. for me when my uh, jobs fell away. Um, we went online. All my schools went online. I was able to finish the semester, but then the work that usually sustains me over the summer has dried up. Um, and we uh, we had been rehearsing for the show, and then me and the three other dancers started meeting on Zoom and kept trying to create something, and it felt really forced and inauthentic. Um, and so then we just started having this like kind of company class community space where we would do like elongated check-ins. Somebody we'd rotate who was sharing a movement practice, and then we'd create kind of this like communal score, and that felt really good and it felt really connecting. So it was it was letting go of that urge to like make 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 for the moment to sustain my identity and my sense of normalcy, but also um, thinking like, oh, I, I have a grant cycle. I, I, if I don't make something new, I'm not going to have documentation and I'm not gonna be able to get any grants to fund what I'm making. Like there's that capitalistic cycle of independent art making that felt like like a, like my my wheel had to keep turning, mm -hmm. um, and then we stepped back and, and was like this is going to be better for for the group and for the community. And since our community's actually expanded, we've had other people join us, and so that was nice. That's been a really good um, I, words are today. Words are sometimes coming and going for me, but that's felt like. <sighs> I like your expressions and sound effects for the feelings. I think they convey as much or maybe more than the words would anyway. So it works. Well, good, because there's going to be more of them. Yeah, good. <laughs> this is why I love hanging out with dance artists. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm really sorry that your work dried up. Like, I, you know, that's my fear for a lot of our community. Um, all artists and creatives and adjunct professors. Um, you know, I, so... Our, at our university, we're actually having a hard time filling adjunct positions, and I wonder if that's going to continue into the into the future. In part, that's because a lot of people who usually teach with us, because of the pandemic, had to stop and rethink what they're doing so they can survive. And so some are going back to school, some are moving. Um, but also, who would want to take that on right now? Um, you know, anyone who has ever taught as an adjunct understands that if you actually calculate the pay per hour, it's um, it'll bring tears to your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> As mimed by Lexi. <laughs> For those who haven't, would you mind giving some insight into that? About the, the dollars? For those of, who haven't gone through that cycle. Absolutely. Um, so it, it differs between university to university. Most major like state universities are going to pay somewhere between $2,500 and $4,000 for one three credit hour class. And that is, you know, all the prep work, 
sometimes you might come in with a syllabus that was built by a full-time faculty and you have you can tweak it but there's always going to be a lot of prep work and then the time in class and then time grading and time outside of class sustaining those mentorship relationships with students which the thing about adjunct professors is that by and large they're really dedicated so they're going to give that time to their students and so if you calculate all that up per week it could become a full-time job really fast, even if you're only teaching two classes, which by the way, most full-time faculty are on a three-two schedule, which means they're teaching two full-time classes in the fall and two in the spring. And then the rest of their professional expectations are around research and service for the university. So like having time for your practice is built into a livable salary. Um, some places, uh, a couple places probably pay like $6,000, which is fair, but that's really rare. I taught at a community college once that paid me um, $1,600 for a three credit hour class. Granted, the cost of living is low in central Alabama, but that's not, I mean, it. Um, <laughs> I want to I add that that's $1,600 for the duration of the semester. For a three credit, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, that's not sustainable. Um, and the rub is, um, Finn might regret asking me to get on the soapbox because I could get, I could stay on it for a while. Um, but the, the rub is you, most people need to adjunct for a while in order to move on to a higher or more stable position in higher education. And however, in order to really get one of those jobs, you have to have a really good studio practice and exhibition record. Like Lexi was just referring to, you know, there's a pressure to always be making and, and, and prove your uh, value as a creator and academic. But if you're um, teaching for beans, then you also probably need to have another job that you're working close to full time, uh, which I did while I was adjuncting. And the time left over for your creative research practice, and writing, whatever it is that you do, is pretty sparse. Um, so it's, uh, it's it's really difficult to get a footing into a career that can actually uh, keep a roof over your head. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. So with that, that's so that's the context. And so with COVID, you know, there's it's going to be even more work. Full-time faculty and adjuncts alike have to do more work. Like it, it's just thanks COVID. Um, yeah. You know, there's no getting around it. Um, but I don't know if adjuncts are going to still want to do that work. Um, I, I, it remains to be seen. I, I really hope we can support them and help them come in. I think, yeah, you're, um, so I've been two years out of grad school now. I've had four semesters of adjuncting and um, I, I love teaching and my art making. They're on the same pedestal for me. I really feel like they inform one another and I, I just light up in both spaces in different ways. And I am so depleted from adjuncting. I don't know how people do this for 10 years or whatever they are because you're disconnected from your student body. And I, I, I've made it a habit now of explaining to my students that I am an adjunct professor and, 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 and I'm making them understand what that is and that I am not as available um, to, as, to them as faculty that are full-time because I am only on campus the days that I'm paid to be there for my office hours and for those classes. And so it, sometimes it can feel like a slog and sometimes I can feel really disconnected and it kind of depletes me because I, I want to give them that advising. I want to give that extra energy. I want to be on campus when, when you are there also. But for example, my busiest adjunct semester, like I, when you were talking about the three, two, Fen and I had a conversation about this, uh, I don't know, a while back, and I was like, how many classes are you teaching? At my most, going into a semester, I taught three at one school and two at the other. One of them didn't run due to low student enrollment because um, the of lack of advertisement, and um, but I had to still prepare that whole course over a month and a half time and then didn't get compensated for any of that prep work because, um, and the, the big thing about adjuncting that's really, um, uh, exhausting is that I um, get my contract now and then up until like four, five days before the fall, if that class doesn't hit whatever the enrollment is, um, that all of that money is taken away from me. And so um, I have no guarantee. There's no like, oh, you prepped and you prepared and you, we already told you that you were going to be remote in the in fall 2020. So you probably spent the whole summer putting your class online. Um, and there's just that instability and then you go through that whole um, emotional 
cycle, emotional abuse cycle from the university system every semester. One thing I just, I keep telling people is if, if there was a way that you could, we could give adjuncts contracts that at least lasted an academic year instead of semester to semester, there, there would be so much less internal stress because right now I, as a working professional with a master's degree, I'm adjuncting at two colleges between three and five classes a semester. I am teaching uh, children dance. I judge for dance competitions. I travel and do workshops and choreography. Um, I bartend on the side. Um, I've started doing some tutoring um, in the um, interactive media platform Isadora, um, which is great for me because um, I spent a lot of time at, at, in my master's program utilizing this awesome tool and then have had no time or opportunity to really delve into it post um, because of the work. And then actually I think, I'm, oh, I've done like some random copywriting. I've, I have like at least eight jobs at any one time. And so then like figuring out the three hour chunk in a week that I've carved out to make my art and make it count. Like get in that studio and don't waste a single second. And if you don't come out, Twyla, or, I don't know why she just popped into my head. <laughs> she's, not my, she's not my moniker, but she's the one that just came into my head. Um, then, you're, then that time is wasted. Like it's, it's that capitalist mindset. Like I have to do all of these things to sustain myself and I'm doing this sustainment and all of this gigging to eventually, for me, get a full-time faculty position and then continue my art making under the stability of a full-time position um, or I'm in the guise of stability, whatever. The offer, the promise of stability. And but then having to crank things out too. I, it's just, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a slog. That's, that's what I call adjuncting. It's, it's great and I love it, but I feel really disconnected from my students and I, and I want not to be. And there's another aspect too, to Can juggling all those things. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, because I, I really love where this conversation is. I want to put two thoughts in your brains as you keep talking about it. And um, the first is, um, how has COVID shifted the situation? And if, it's given more space for like reimagining what adjuncting could look like. Like, what support do you need? Where can you get it? Like, how should universities be changing? Yes, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, uh, I, I, I will go to Melissa first. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're in the middle Thank of you. the floor. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I, I want to be so. I want to be clear that you know my gripe about adjuncting is not a complaint at my specific university, which I really love. I'm I'm an alumnus of the university where I work full time now, and I, I like it, it's dear to me. This is a systemic problem across higher education in general. That being said, each university does each university leadership does have the opportunity to be thinking about this. Um, what I know now because I'm I'm staff in my department, and so I um, I I get. I don't see everything that happens, you know, I don't look at our books, but I do have a pretty good perspective on like the way the system is kind of working. I'm learning a lot. And I see, you know, I see the leadership in our department not having a lot of agency either. Like even our own department chair um, doesn't have the power to make certain things happen. And so the, while we can communicate what we need as adjuncts or as adjunct allies to our department chairs, um, what maybe what we might need to ask of them is that they take that communication on up to the deans and to the provost and to the presidents of the university and that we ourselves maybe follow up and, and voice it as well because, um, you know, teaching, research, service, um, you know, it, adjuncts provide all of those even if they're not um, being paid for it. And I think if those are the things that universities value, then, um, then we need to value those people who are doing it. And um, I think if we do have a scarcity of adjuncts in the fall due to COVID, it might be an opportunity for a supply and demand pressure to be placed there too. Um, but, but that requires people saying no to adjunct positions. And the trouble with that is we want jobs. We have to adjunct to get the jobs, but you, you know, I, well, Lexi, your suggestion was great, at least a one-year contract so that, um, you know, you're not at a loss in the middle of the uh, Christmas, basically, finding out you didn't get a class, um, Christmas or the holidays in general. Um, and maybe even some summer work, you know, if you have spare classes in the summer, that was an issue for me adjuncting is in the summer, I just like was up a creek without a paddle. Um, 
and higher pay, <laughs> please. <laughs> And maybe let adjuncts find a way to buy into the benefit system or something. Um, you know, healthcare is pretty great. Uh, I'm a fan. I like the benefits I get from the university, and I think uh, it'd be great for our adjuncts to have access to that too. So maybe don't cap our adjuncts at a certain course number to keep them below full-time capacity. As I think out loud like this, maybe the answer is no more adjuncts make full-time positions where we have lecturers who teach four or five classes a semester. It's a lot of work, but if you can give them a salary and, and benefits, you're gonna retain that person longer, they're gonna be healthier and happier, and your students are gonna get better results. And there's gonna be someone constant there. Like, again, like that's the thing is, I am running from seven jobs every week, and I'm like, I would love to sit here and talk to you about all the things that you wanna discuss in dance studies, but I have to run to my ne next five jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like it, I. I, I love the idea. And so the, uh, the reason that they don't currently do that is because they're saying, well, if we're going to pay you for a year, what happens if no student enrolls? And then like, where is it going to get that money? But if we're thinking about the trifecta of what faculty do, full-time faculty typically do at universities, teaching, research, service, if you give an adjunct a number of credit hour contract, even if it's part-time, it's not full-time, for the academic year as opposed to the semester. If that class doesn't run, maybe they step into a service position, maybe they step into a committee position, a curriculum development. Um, like, I would love to get into advising. I don't even, I, one of the schools I'm at was um, just started a dance um, um, associate of arts program and I've told students yeah go talk to your counselor about it and then they come back to me and say oh my counselor said that there is no dance program here I'm like well I'm here to tell you it is look at me I'm here I'm real I'm not made of <laughs> gas like you know and so maybe even just inserting the adjuncts in the vital veins of the institution mm -hmm. will help strengthen other other areas and um, one thing I wanted to point out is the idea of full-time faculty um, again, like like you said, this is a systemic problem. Both of the schools that I teach at right now um, do not have any full-time faculty in dance. Not a single person in dance that is full-time. Everyone is an adjunct because we're outsourcing the labor. And some people um, are, are, are plenty happy to do that. Like I have a colleague who has a full-time job and she just loves coming in once a week to teach ballet. And that's her prerogative. And I think that it's amazing that there's a space for that. But if that's the expectation, then we're, we're causing like larger issues. So like if, if we're just gonna outsource everything and have no full-time positions, we're not gonna be able to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And also like, I'm thinking, okay, if I, in this fall specifically for me, if um, all of my classes dry up, uh, except for one that I think might be able to be viable online, um, how, do I force myself to stay in academia? Like if my goal is a full-time faculty position somewhere, which it is, um, if I take any semesters off, uh, because the uh, because I'm in solidarity and an adjunct movement because I cannot physically get adjunct work because I would like to chase another interest um, is that going to hurt me um, against all of the other people I, I saw a statistic that there are like 600 dance programs in the United States um, collegiate dance programs and then like you whittle that down to the amount to what you're you know doing positions available being able to get into that pool and then and ev everything is also like I, I have to kind of stay in this hamster wheel to be a um, option for mm -hmm. hiring committee um, yeah summer work is, is a great idea I, I and because I'm usually fine living the gig life I've been doing it since I was 18 COVID-19 is a perfect example of why that does not work for me mm -hmm. um, because everything just, and um, one thing that um, I appreciate about both of the schools that I'm at is that there are unions. Um, mm -hmm. They need to be, uh, adjuncts need to be made aware that there are unions, um, where to find their reps, where the websites are, all of that stuff. I didn't know um, until this semester of, of working at one of them that the union even exists. And the other one, I only found out because I passed a conversation in the hallway. And now I'm a member and I, I'm benefiting all of those, you know, all of the ways that I am in that union. But it, it wasn't it wasn't made known to me. And I, I'm fresh out of grad school. No one in my family has a higher degree or no one works in higher education. I don't know to go ask, hey, where's the union? You know, who do, do I contact? So I, I think it's also like, um, maybe seeing adjuncts, especially if they're earlier in their career, like I am and saying like, what do you not even know exists? And how can I get you the 
the information, the email to the person that's gonna that's gonna help you there. Um, I was getting underpaid because of of um, our, my hourly my rate because of that, and I didn't realize until a half semester later, and then I had to go back and fight with the college for it um, to get the the pay that I rightfully deserved. Um, I also have the course that I mentioned that I developed and um, didn't run, just low student enrollment, lots of different factors. Um, I was told I was getting a curriculum development stipend from that, from the one school, which was fantastic. And I have followed up a lot of times about it and have not yet been able to get that money. So it's also, and since again, there are no full-time faculty and the person who I go to for my um, advocacy is a um, oversees a lot of programs outside of the arts. Um, it's really hard to find someone to help me advocate um, because I can I hit a brick wall eventually. So yeah, that's I think there's something about maybe even just um, br uh, bringing in not full time faculty into um, committee decisions and f like college-wide meetings and understanding that we are the majority of the people that are actually teaching the students, but we're not really, rarely ever in the room um, when the decisions are being made about it, so. Yep. Well, you made a really good point earlier in our conversation about always informing the students of what your situation is and what your position is. I think that's brilliant. I did that too when I was working primarily as an adjunct uh, because they don't know, first of all, and they're also like, I don't know, I've never had a student who seemed like they didn't give a care about people, right? Like this, this, all the students I've ever met in my classes have been really thoughtful, kind people. Mm -hmm. And when they learn of this, they're shocked, right? Mm -hmm. And if we look at other social movements that are happening, we see that um, this, this generation that's in college right now, it like doesn't really stand for, uh, for injustices and so I do think that educating them in you know not in a way that's going to incite riots in your class you know just informing them this is the situation this is why I'm not more available to you <laughs> well not breaking university yeah, and it's, it's just a temporary yeah and it's just it's 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 clearly to say I want to be available to you you also need to understand how I fit into your your puzzle and that I have to have a wider range of response time to your emails. And this is, I really only can be on campus this day. It's, it's tempering their expectations of how I can actually be a resource to them. Yep. Um, so that, you know, and, and I, I'm always like, hey, if you don't know how your teach, like, you know, get to know your teachers. Are they full-time faculty? Do they have open office hours all of the time? You're going to know how accessible they are to you in that way. Um, and I think like when we think about like resources, like you said, this generation, I don't think it's just providing adjuncts or it's faculty. It's thinking about like basic human rights, like basic, like universal income, health care, universal child care, things that will affect, that like would automatically affect my well-being in this precarious job position, but also my students, also mm -hmm. everyone. Um, so yeah, I think that this idea of like this greater like citizen and human well-being is like really directly tied in especially in the time of COVID, like especially as we moved online. And I, um, you know, I worked in the, in a, I work in a um, predominantly like low income area and just making sure that I'm not excluding students when we moved online, like that was a whole dance, a whole other thing. And so just like the need for not even just like student and teacher basic um, healthcare things, living situations is really important. I think on that note, I'm going to invite you if you've got final thoughts before we move to questions. I think this is a really interesting place to stop, but what would you like to wrap up with? Um, everyone has frozen. There you go, you're back. Okay, you're back. Okay, good. Um, well, um, you know, one thing that has occurred to me from my privileged position of having a full-time job still and working from home is that um, I'm still being really productive at my job, but it's intersecting with everything else I do a little bit more fluidly now that I'm working from home. And so I'm, when, when we go back, however and whenever that is, I'm gonna carry with me a new perspective about balance in my life. Um, and, and not being, I think because I had had so many jobs in, retail and uh, logistics and things that were 
like uh, sort of panoptic, like, it, like there was always a manager looking to see how productive you were being and every second counts and you can't take a break longer than the allotted one and you get docked and you're gonna be fired, right? I think I carried that sort of like oppressive capitalist mindset into this job, thinking about productivity in terms of that strictness. And I, I think it's important for, for me going back to think differently about that, to not be at my desk, like really conscious of time and not pausing to have a casual conversation with my coworker without feeling stressed about not being productive. Um, but also like not feeling guilty if I wanna take 10 minutes to answer a curator email about a show that I have, right? Like it's not making my, me do my job any worse. Um, and again, that comes from a very, I, I recognize the, the privilege of having the job from which I can flex into that. But I, I, I hope that as we go forward, employees and employers, supervisors, supervisees alike are going to have a renewed sense of work-life balance and of trust in, in their team to do their work, even if they have to take a break and go walk around the block for 30 minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely. I, um, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I made some notes and I'm like reviewing them right now just for my, my thoughts and something that I, we didn't, I, I, I didn't touch on is the idea that like the artist side of things like I, one thing that I've, I've run up against is um, I mean kind of I, I'm looking at my notes then <laughs> don't give me a shrug um, is uh, one thing I'm running up against because I am fresh out of my master's degree and um, in academia adjuncting but also happy to be in that space is this like rub of um, um, funders uh, and grantee organizations saying, well, if you're connected to a institution, then your art is um, somehow less. And I'm, well, I'm like, well, if you're not going to provide me resources, where am I supposed to get these resources from? So thinking about that, like in Chicago, we, um, we've been going to like the public parks when um, we had nothing else to do and just sitting on the grass in, in this COVID time and thinking like, okay, when everything opens back up, I can rent the soccer field. Like what kind of public spaces are there that we can like imagine for artists that are like open source, like public parks um, and I don't, things like that. And what are, what are barriers that can, we can remove um, in, in that aspect, like thinking going out of COVID, like I've been trying to apply for things and I don't have the funds for some of the application fees. So like, is there a way that we can make that more accessible with a sliding scale or um, something? Um, that, Cause there's this like mysterious access where I'm supposed to be able to um, produce, but I'm not getting any support for space and collaborators and materials and things like that um, while balancing teaching and, and art making. Um, I think that the, yeah, the biggest thing for me right now is is that distinction um, between um, teaching and art making and sometimes the barrier that exists between them. Um, and yeah, letting artists make, not because they feel like they must grind, but what spaces can we have for them to just arise? Mm -hmm. That's a lovely note. Thank you both so much. Um, before I welcome everyone back in, um, and thank you, Melissa, for bringing up administration, because I can tell you now that the very first of our July talks, we are going to have Amy Schmidt and Trina Phillips talking about university administration, um, which will be our talk next week. Following that, we will have Lawrence Jackson and Anne Cooper Albright talking about department leadership. Um, we'll have um, Julia Gleick and Molly Faulkner on institutional exhaustion. Um, we're really getting into it in July. We will have Amelia Stewart and Chandler talking about um, the undergraduate experience. And then we are going to have uh, Rebecca Salsa and Amir Zahari who are going to be talking about collaboration. So we should end July on a really joyous note. Um, I hope that those of you listening will come back and join us for some of those talks. Um, but right now, let us be in the moment that we are. I hope that's given some of our guests time to think of questions and thoughts that they have. Um, I'm going to invite you all to unmute yourselves, show your video, um, and let's start off again by thanking Alexandra and Melissa. Thank you so much. What questions do folks have? Give everyone a moment to get a text sorted.
Sydney, since you're available, I'm going to put you on the spot. You knew I was going to, because you talked about kind of making a career for yourself um, in quite a different world of the arts. Does any of what's been saying resonate for you? Uh, yes, I actually went during the talk and looked at my bank statement and decided that adjuncting is a waste of my time, which is terrible because that's what I thought I would do. I'm literally teaching one dance class a day, one hour, and my prep time is very low and I make what you make or more in a semester, in a whole semester course. And I didn't realize that that was actually the case because I mean, my, my dream, you know, I really want to go back into academia. I would like to teach. Um, that's kind of where I see myself yeah, maybe 10 years from now when I'm like done dancing, I keep coming back for better, for worse. Um, and uh, I mean, I understand having taught in a grad program at Michigan. Um, I mean, I know what goes into teaching a course. And I think just hearing that number, I was like, so wait, let me think about where it's going, um, what I want to do, what kind of artist will it help me be? Is it going to help me be the kind of artist I want to be? Right now, um, I'm surviving COVID, uh, hopefully created a product that will keep me going and completely, I can work from anywhere, from my living room. So now if this is ongoing, I can literally have whatever career I want whenever this opens up. So this is amazing. Um, obviously, you know, contingent on me continuing to provide a product that people around the world want to engage in. Um, and I think also I've realized that the experience that I've created for myself, like I've already taught over a hundred classes, the experience mm -hmm. like that I've gained, um, I'd be really interested to see how that translates into an application for university. I've obviously you know, I, I appreciate it a lot more than I expected. Um, but then, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm interested in going into a PhD program so that I can focus on scholarship and creating and writing. Uh, but just thinking broad picture of where am I going? What do I need to do to get there? And is it what I think it's going to be? So this is really helpful to hear about your experiences. So thank you for sharing. Of course, I was thinking like, I, I, I really ping pong back and forth and adjuncting of saying like, this is really great because it allows me to work on art, but also teach at the same time. And I don't know that I would have that time if I had jumped to do a full-time position right out of grad school, but then also, yeah, like what, am I just sustaining this so that I can get to the full-time job later because it, it really doesn't pay the bills and I'm teaching way more than a lot of full-time faculty do. It's, it's a, it's a push and a go. And you mentioned grad school and I had another thought about that. Another thing is to, if you fund some of your grad students, you fund all of your grad students because then you're going to shove some of your grad students out into the world with, um, graduate school debt that is also on their shoulders on top of their art making, on top of their adjuncting, on top of COVID and whatever else is happening. Um, not funding your grad students means they get less teaching experience. So the people who are marginalized when they come into grad school are marginalized when they come out of grad school, have less of a leg up in the job market. Like the cycle perpetuates. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, mean, I could speak for way too long about the privilege of who gets funded in grad school it is not because actually I did have a question um do you is it important to adjunct in order to apply for a faculty position how or rather how important is that um given that I just discovered that maybe that isn't the route I want to take I'll I'll jump in on this one Lexi if that's all right with you um I I was really close to uh, to getting a faculty job right before COVID, maybe was gonna be offered the job. I, like, I kind of got that uh, feeling that that might've happened. Um, COVID made the university call it, but I did the on-campus interview and everything, so. Um, exactly the same, Melissa, me too. Really? Same situation, yep. COVID 
COVID. <laughs> Rona! <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is probably the same for you, Lexi, but I don't, I don't, I'm in visual art, right? So it might be different, but a lot of the questions were about teaching. Now this is at you know, a state institution, right? And um, it is a research position that I was applying for, but, um, you know, we talked about my work and, and scholarship and perspectives, but we did talk a lot about teaching. So I do think having some experience, some recent experience in the classroom will be good for you. So whether adjuncting is worth your time financially is a different question than whether it's worth your time long term. But, um, you know, it sounds like if you're for you, if you're going to go into a PhD program, I might not adjunct until you do that. Um, but I mean, who knows, everyone's different. But I do think it's worth teaching at least one class a semester or one class a year if you can. Um, because you're going to, well, for us in visual art, you need to have a your own portfolio of work and, and a teaching portfolio and you want your teaching portfolio to have good stuff and you're going to have more good stuff the more classes you teach and you also want it to be pretty recent they're going to have questions if you only have a portfolio from five years ago they're also going to be really specific on the job application that they're looking for people with collegiate or university teaching experience mm -hmm. and recent student reviews recent yes. student um, feedback um, within a certain time period. Some of the applications literally said um, feedback from students, you know, so even remembering as an adjunct, like, oh, I need to build in some kind of recordable student feedback because neither of my schools have a SEI system that actually happens through the school so that I have that going into those jobs. And I would say if, if I have to um, get some kind of full-time work to sustain myself because work dries up in the fall because of COVID. I will still adjunct when I can on the side because it does bring me joy. It's when, it's, it's when the world, it's very vague, but I'm going to, you know, um, it makes it seem like adjuncting is the full-time gig and it, it is not. That's when it is. I think adjuncting is really beautiful when, because you get to be in that environment. I thrive around college students. I thrive around that level of, you know, of, of, learner um but yeah so being in it all the time i would say yes absolutely like if it's something you're interested in definitely pursue it i think it'll help you um it's that decision of is this going to be all that i'm doing and in the attempts to hopefully get a full-time job and what that's going to entail in the umpteen number of years it's going to you're going to be adjuncting until the full-time job comes around i will say with a phd you are slightly more likely i believe to go from your PhD into at least a, a, a year-long contract or three-year contract. Um, but you're, you're doing a PhD may alter the kinds of teaching experience available to you. So when I was going through my PhD, I was very deliberate in making sure I taught the things I wanted to later teach um, so that I didn't get pigeonholed by my PhD. Um, so if that is on your future and you go through the PhD, look to your look to the job that you want in your future and try and teach those things. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you. Yeah, it's really I really appreciate hearing all of this. Um, so I really appreciate these talks. It's been really good to listen in and um, hear from folks in the industry. And I've been out of it for a couple of years now. So looking towards, you know, where am I now? And, and what does it look like from not a graduate student perspective has been really eye opening, especially during COVID, especially looking forward, like towards next year, nobody has any information um, at all. So yeah, we're going on nothing here, which to me, I'm seeing every single community doing this. And I'm like, I wish people would think of like a longer term solution for not just putting a band aid, but how do we actually engage people in a learning experience on these new online platforms and prepare for the worst as in like, if they say we can go back to school tomorrow, great. But this is the state of the world for the next year. It's just how it's going to be, especially in the US, because we've got half of the US uh, silent majority not wearing masks and partying. Um, yeah. So that's we're not on the recording, right? Oh, yeah, we are. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I was looking we at that. We're recorded. 
in a in a in a diverted subject um, so that everybody forgets um, that that was on the record. Um, can we talk just for a minute while we've still got some time about your art making practices? Because Melissa, I know that you're you're running vinegar, um, and I would love to hear how that is going for you and how COVID has like shifted your artistic practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, uh, so it's a two-part answer because um, vinegar is, it, it's an administrative kind of thing that I'm doing or community, but it's also, I, I think of it as an extension of my creative practice. And then there's like the art that I make. Um, so vinegar, which is um, right now, I think the easiest way to describe it is that we're a gallery. We're like a, we're like a expanded practices art gallery, um, but we're more than that. And um, you know, when, when COVID came to the US, uh, the other co-director, Ann Tronson, and I uh, talked about it and decided that like all things vinegar just need to go on the back seat. You know, we knew to be responsible for medical reasons, we cleared the calendar for all of 2020, which we had booked with shows for the whole year. Um, so we cleared the rest of our calendar. And we also decided that, that we, well, we noticed that there was a lot of content that really quickly started pouring onto social media and the internet with all these different art, arts organizations. Um, I think wanting to be helpful, but also maybe to some extent to like justify their existence during this time to an extent, or maybe like certain people in those institutions felt the need to like show that they're contributing something because we're all afraid of getting fired, right? So there was this excess of what I keep calling noise. There was some good stuff too, but it was just so much. I was like, I don't want to ask any attention of anybody and I definitely don't want to fundraise right now um, but uh, so we just decided uh, like the best thing for us to do is to step back and give space and then after George Floyd was murdered we um, we had started thinking about like maybe we should get in the public again but once George Floyd is murdered we decided okay we still need to hang back Nobody needs to hear from us. We don't need to virtue signal out into the world that we care about this. I think um, our alignment with social justice values is in our mission and in our core values. And like, we just don't wanna take up any more space. So again, we're hanging back. Um, but we have uh, started to put our heads together about next steps for the organization. We're making plans as if COVID isn't here. Because we know that one day, I don't know when, but one day COVID will be something that we're controlling or that is in our past or we have a vaccine for or something and we still want to move the organization forward so we're actually proactively looking into the next chapter for the organization beyond what we're doing now um, and it's actually been a real source of joy because we're all kind of it's a groundhog day for everyone all the time so to be thinking about the future and and building opportunities for people is really it's been really exciting um, Art practice. Uh, I just didn't do anything for like the first month. I would do my job and then I would binge Netflix, right? Um, like I said, like my cat almost died. I was upset. I was depressed. I was, you know, I just like, and I gave myself permission for that. I, you know, for like a week people were like, look at what Einstein comp accomplished when he was, you like all this pressure to be creative. And then culture put the kibosh on that pretty quickly. And I was glad to see that because, you know, we all have to just embrace this trauma that we're going in, like acknowledge the trauma of, of the collective trauma of the pandemic and also of you know grief over the loss of so many uh, people due to racial violence that we just it's okay um, but there's nothing like a deadline and I have a show coming up which I'm grateful for it's still happening and um, and so thankfully I'm making again and Working from home makes it a lot easier to transition into studio time at home because the commute time is gone, right? Like um, all of the nonsense is gone. So being an artist right now is just a little bit easier than it was before, which I'll take that as a tiny silver lining, I guess. I'm so glad that whatever show you're doing is still going. That's awesome and joyous. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I had, a, I saw a bunch of like directives, you know, dance film, do, do these five things, shoot it on your iPhone. And I, I'm, I'm bookmarking. I had like I, one, one week at the, towards the beginning, I had a browser tab with like 25 
things open and I was like, well, what are these going to be my jumping off COVID project? And then I just didn't even look, I closed them all and um, was, yeah, then this is, yeah, like early COVID. And then we got to a place where, yeah, when George Floyd got murdered, it was like, okay, my, our internal practice is important, but my public voice is, is, is not the one that should be filtering through feeds right now. And so like the, the dancers that I've been working with, we've just been like meeting and not dancing and kind of sharing um, anti-racist strategies, just things, just, and realizing like, you know, um, what we don't know. And it's been good. Uh, yeah, I also um, I'm, was uh, supposed to get married in Denver in August and then that had to be canceled because of COVID. So the past like month has been like a replanning a wedding kind of thing in 50 days. So that's also taken up a lot of my life. And I've just kind of given myself permission to say that um, you, I, I, I am still an artist, even if I am not currently making art. Like one thing I'm actually reading finally um, after being on my bookshelf for a while, Amanda Palmer's book, um, uh, the Art of Asking. I love Amanda Palmer. Um, and it's been, it, it's like that permission, like nobody tells you, no one gives you the golden goblet. Now you're an artist. You're an artist when you say you're an artist. There's no funding structure. There's no festival that proves it. Like you don't have to get a Bessie or end up at Dumbo Dance or whatever to reach that. And I, it's just been leaning into that. Like if I'm in my hibernation period, because I am doing self-work in another way, if I'm in survival mode, if I am just completely stunned and overwhelmed, um, or maybe just taking time to um, be a human, whatever that means, um, and teaching myself how to crochet, which has been fun. Um, that's also going to feed eventually. Um, uh, my uh, to be premiered in the fall online or in person or who knows how um, dance and intermedia company still go is we've still been meeting. Um, and the festival that we were commissioned to present a work in has moved to November. I am hopeful that there's some way that it can still happen if it needs to be and probably will be, as Sydney said, shifted later again. Um, um, I'm hoping I can support that arts organization. I'm like, how do I support? I don't have monetary means to support you. I'm just going to share the things you share because if you go under my, my festival goes under my, you know, abilities. So it's all very intertwined. And so I think I've even just stepped back from my own art making process and been like, how can I be attentive to the structures that will support me later? And, um, hopefully like I was, we were invited back to do, uh, we were invited to the festival commission to do a work, um, like a 20 minute work, and then also invited back to do a full length work next summer. So I'm gonna be working towards that. And um, in my search for a full-time job in academia, that'll probably pull me away from Chicago. I decided that um, I do love the Chicago dance scene and I love the artists that I've been working with there and um, whatever art making, cause it's possible on digital spaces. Um, is going to be like dual city whenever that happens. So just kind of reimagining how I'm, I'm that this work isn't anchored in one place has been um, that less making and more dreaming, more mm -hmm. and reading Amanda Palmer's book, The Art of Asking. It's just it's oh, it's been good. Let's Highly make recommend. More dreaming is a fantastic line, and on that like, hopeful note, um, I will put out a last call for questions. And if there aren't any, I will turn the recording off, and we can defragment for the last few minutes. Um, so do folk, are there any more questions that folks want asked or answered? Um, can can I ask one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, and my apologies if this has been covered already. Um, to um, real talk with everyone, I got I got a message that my COVID test results came back in the middle of this talk, so I had to go handle that, and they came back negative, so that's good news. Um, <laughs> uh, so I apologize if this has been covered already, um, but um, um, I think my my question is for you know as as someone who teaches um in a, a school with music with with music and dance programs with master's degrees and phd degrees um and you know for now has a tenure track position um what kinds of things should i be advocating for in my institution to help support part-time faculty and create the best conditions possible um and what kinds of advice should i be giving students who are in some way interested in um, planning or preparing for a blended career for themselves, um, given you know, that their career would, would, would likely look different than mine has so far. 
uh, Lexi, I'll recap the first part if you wanna address the advice to the students part, does that work? And again, I'm sorry if you've covered this already. I, I had to step away. We haven't that. actually, so. We've okay, covered good. a little bit in the first part, but it will be good to bullet point it again. Yeah, yeah and uh, we, talk, we did discuss about advocacy for adjunct professors, but not from the perspective of if you are a full-time faculty, how do you advocate? And um, the one thing that I will rehash is that I, I think that we all need to start speaking to our leadership from chair to dean to provost to university president um, about the inequities and the, pro the basically human rights violations almost of, uh, of the adjunct system. And after Lexi and I bounced ideas around a little bit, uh, a few really good ones came up and it sounds like we were heading in the direction of suggesting um, either at least make sure all adjuncts have one year contracts so that PS they should, they should have a well advanced notice of signing on to and not at the very last minute. Um, so that they have at least 12 months of pay and if, they're, um, if their course doesn't meet enrollment and that, that course doesn't make, then they can still be put to work doing research or service. Um, and I think that like the, Lexi, that, that last bit was a brilliant idea of yours. Um, and or let's just not do this whole adjunct thing anymore. Like let's just make more full-time positions that are lecturer positions. There's not maybe a research uh, expectation that you know you'll get fired if you don't have so many papers published in the next few years but you just teach four classes a semester and you get a salary and benefits um, it works better for everyone so I think if we start advocating for that um, then best case scenario that happens worst case scenario maybe they at least start paying adjuncts a little better right well that's not the worst case scenario but <laughs> yeah it's true I just burn it to the ground that's my burn the system to the ground and rebuild it like yeah even like um like even if you know if we're not uh increasing the the base pay of adjuncts um like like the thing that when i entered is like i i had to understand and and figure out how adjuncts are paid per credit hour so even if it's an extra credit hour, I might be doing the same amount of work as a one credit class for a three credit class based on what I need to do. Um, so even like adding in curriculum development stipends, um, access to healthcare, um, direct union, like direct emails of union representatives that can help you, um, resources that full-time faculty get, just just things that can, that, that will pad the the um experience of an adjunct faculty with more support mm -hmm. and i think one of the most powerful things that you both talked about is tell students like be really articulate this is what it means to be a full-time faculty member this is what it means to be an adjunct this is the systems that support like tenure track these are the systems that this is why adjuncts will be less available to you and teaching you in different kinds of ways and students respond to that. When, when we moved online, um, I had one very empathetic student log on the first day. And our first class, like so many people, was, how are you doing? Like, just, just feeling, feeling party in jazz one. Um, and she was like, well, before I, we, I answer, like, how are you doing? Like, I, you didn't, I mean, like, all of us are bitching about how we didn't sign up for an online class. You didn't sign up to teach online. And I was like, oh, sweet baby angel. I'm not going to take up the class time to go into that, but I, I appreciate you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think that some of that reflection was because at the beginning of the semester, I, I'm like, hey, I, you need to understand the system if you don't already understand it, because I literally didn't understand it until the end of grad school. Um, mm -hmm. Because I didn't grow up in, in, in a household that had higher education degrees or where anyone taught in academia. So yeah, transparency, that yeah. too. I think a lot of things um, we assume that people know. You assume that adjuncts know where to find these things or have, have been embroiled in these institutions that I so want to get into. And I want to get into it because I was a student and I enjoyed learning, not because I understand the bureaucracy and the ins and outs of academia. And tell your grad students. Like, Cindy was just saying she didn't know what the figures were for what an adjunct is paid. So, like, tell grad students, like, Give them an idea. If they're going to get into the system, tell them what they're getting into. Tell them as they come into audition for grad school so that people can make viable decisions about like what their futures look like and if this is going to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And like when I first went in, I, I emailed my chair at um, Ohio State and was like, what do you pay your adjuncts? 
And do you think that's on par about what I should be trying to get here in Chicago? Um, because I had zero idea if that was the base pay or not. And the first job I was actually offered, I tried to negotiate up and then they cut my line. And so I never, not cut the line, um, cause that's a specific thing. They, they did not, we, we stopped corresponding cause I was advocating for what I thought was fair pay. And so I didn't end up adjuncting there and I got it at two other colleges instead. And if I had not contacted my next chair and felt comfortable to do that in Bolden, then I might've taken that and, and been even more severely underpaid. I think it would have been close to like what Melissa said, like around like 1800 for the semester, but in Chicago, which has a higher cost of living. So I remember it was working out at lower than minimum wage. Yeah, I would also say to uh, Christy J, it, um, advocating for the adjunct faculty to be present um, for conversations around teaching. Um, I know that there are some departmental issues that maybe you don't want extra, you know, um, part-time people in the room, but as often as possible, if the adjuncts can be there, um, I think that'll help them feel included in the culture of the institution. And they actually, I think, could provide a lot of insight um, where other people have blind spots. You know, for instance, a lot of full-time faculty teach, prim at least in my department, teach primarily upper-level classes. And so might not be aware of the issues that the intra-level classes have, et cetera. Um, and one other thing too is it would be nice if departments started providing adjuncts with um, the necessary equipment. Um, that doesn't always happen. I had to provide my own laptop. Um, you know, that's pretty uncool. So advocating for those things is good too. Oh, what about- If I could ask one quick follow-up. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Fan, I, I just There's wanted to ask a quick follow-up. Yeah. Like, ha if you want your adjuncts to hold office hours, don't make them do it on a table in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. oh, I was, I was just going to ask, um, how, if y'all have thoughts on, on, on the subject of, of including or inviting, um, adjunct faculty to participate in conversations, decisions, etc. Can you think of the strategies or or a register in which to ask that question to make that invitation in such a way that it is not an implicit demand or expect uh, uh, demand for or expectation of further unpaid work mm. pay them to come to staff meetings <laughs> yeah i would be for uh, that yeah especially in admissions positions like um melissa said like I, i'm on the ground with these students in their first year there like I, i'm seeing the populations and the needs of the population of the students like wouldn't you want my words about who is who were I, the programs that i'm at currently don't require auditions but like even just like how we are marketing to who what who we're trying to bring in yeah pay me pay me money like i also like to eat but like so food is also you know decent compensation but money <laughs> That's hard. Yeah, that is a hard question. I, I was asked to be on a um, search committee for a new faculty member and I was really excited about it, but I, I did put in a lot of work that I didn't get paid for. And I think I'm just conditioned um, to understand um, because of how society has set up my role. I don't know that like I, I, I'm going to do a lot of unpaid work mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that's acceptable in a university. Um, even a little bit. Um, if the guy from HR next to me is being paid to be there, then where is my Visa gift card for yeah. attendance. <laughs> I mean, side note, uh, I think part of that conditioning is because you're a creative person and that industry, even outside of academia, um, perpetuates this system of unpaid labor and that has to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I'm here to say it, I'll keep saying it. Do not do work for free. Do not ask people to do work for free, right? Like all of us here, know that but i'm saying it to the world um like with vinegar that's one of our things with vinegar like we will never ask an artist to do anything for free unless it's a uh gesture of volunteerism like showing up to do something out of a volunteer spirit right like if we ask them to do a show i don't care if they sell work or if they sit there like a M marina abramovic um staring at people they're gonna get paid because creative labor is labor and like 
people are going to continue to abuse creative people if if some of those people are still working for free and i you know that's one of those things that we just have to keep talking about and we should to go back to one of your original questions we should be talking to students about that in our classes um starting on day one yeah because we're a, a lot of my students a lot of the students are, are maybe not going to be art makers are, are like you know producers of art themselves but they obviously are in the fold and so they you know even if they're just going to be patrons of the arts like if they can help perpetuate a more sustainable system it's, it's just going to be better for all and and uh, i saw this conversation in um, online board i'm in that i wish i could recall at the moment but the idea of like there's a certain point in a lot of artist careers where they um, don't find art making sustainable and so they shift in the art world to a curatorial or a management position, a nonprofit that is a sustainable or a real job. There's family members of mine that are saying that, not, you know, me. And um, you don't, th th those positions that you shift into that are real and that pay well are shit if you don't have artists to curate and manage and, you know, all that stuff. So like, yeah, mm -hmm. just burn, burn it to the ground, 2020. Hey. One very practical tip that I advocate for everyone to do if they have job security is every time you see a job posting comes out that is not transparent as to the compensation it is offering, ask. Like a lot of job notices in the artistic world come out through Facebook. The first comment should be, what compensation are you offering your artists? Mm -hmm. um, especially, and I see now a lot of calls going out um, for black artists. Um, and black creators, and they're very, and they're very much. You should do this because it will uplift other black people. Um, and there's no mention of pain. There's no mention of compensation. Um, so if folks who do have that security and do not need the job can put themselves out and go, what compensation are you offering? Um, on that note, we are talking of labor over time. Uh, <laughs> because we're great at that. So what I am going to do is I am going to stop recording. I am going to invite people to hang out and network for a little while, share their email addresses, breathe out. Um, but for, for all time's sake, Lexi, would you, would you wrap us up with a, with a gesture and a sound effect? Oh, yes, I would love to. Where are we I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give us a score. I want us to all inhale at the same time and, and gather some kind of tension in the body. And then as we exhale, um, let both of both your voice and your muscles go ah go out relax out all right oh. all together we <laughs> uh. Uh. <laughs> thank you thank you lexi and thank you finn for organizing this thank, yes. thank you for being thank you everyone <laughs>